Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. My name is Harry Evers, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Santa Fe on this Sunday, March 7th, the third Sunday of Lent. So glad that you tuned in today to join us for worship as we always do every Sunday and to hear beautiful music and to sing the hymns with us to pray prayers, and to attend to the scripture. Today it is the lecture and reading from the Gospel of John in the second chapter, 13 through 22. It's the story of the cleansing of the temple. And we do so from this beautiful sacred space of the sanctuary of the First Presbyterian Church. You're where you are, but we all blend together for worshiping God. It doesn't matter where we are. The only fact is that we are worshiping God by who we are and who we hope to be. I hope that you look on our website to see all the activities and ministries of the church. We are still continuing throughout the pandemic to do good work in the church and beyond in our community and beyond into the world. Be part of all that. I hope you will. Now, next Sunday, just to remind all of you, is when we turn our clocks forward, spring forward, so that uh, we're making sure that we all know what time it is as we worship next Sunday. But now, today, let us worship God. Sunday of Lent, our gospel reading today comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, some of you will recognize the story, see how it sounds. Perhaps there's a way in which these words will speak to you as a matter of faith and life. 
Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. We pray that God will add understanding and appreciation to our hearing of these words. Thanks be to God. come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a communion table. You're all welcome to it. And if there are any children in your household, any youth, anyone else that's not with you right now, oh, go call them. Invite them to come and join you. Go find something in the kitchen for a cracker or, or bread and some juice to share. In a few moments we'll do that. But I look at the table here and our table for communion is always filled with some plates often, our offering plates, a candle to remind ourselves of the light of Christ, and then the bread in the cup coming from the plate here, and this beautiful chalice made for us here at the church by a friend of ours. And what I often see, though, maybe you're seeing that right now at your table, it's a lot of clutter. Well, I have a few things that clutter up this table as well. My mask is here and a few notes in my, my phone. But perhaps you have clutter going on as well. And if there's any children there listening now, what is cluttering up your table or your desk or wherever you are? You know, that's what's happening perhaps in our story today. It comes from the second chapter of John. 
And it's Jesus cleansing the temple. Oh, cleansing the temple. And he throws out the, uh, all the animals and those who are doing the money changing. He turns over the tables. It's kind of like he's cleansing the church. Cleansing our household. Cleansing our minds. What we might do to unclutter what is all around us. Spring is here, almost here at least, and it's a time to unclutter for all of you. What might you want to get rid of? What clutter do you have on your table that you may say, maybe I don't need that anymore? I think we do that every year around this time, but we're doing this in the church as well. What don't we need to take with us any longer? Well, COVID is helping us make those decisions. What might we want to take with us and hold fully in our arms? And what might we want to have that's new that we'll have to include in our holding the things we've taken with us already? So today, simply look around you and say, what can I give away? Somebody else might need it more than I do. What can I do to unclutter my life? What can I do so that I might be more ready to hear the stories of God. And so we come to a story, a story that we remember every month in the Presbyterian Church, a story of Jesus sitting at a table. Oh, I'm not sure if it's like this or not. It might be like your table. It may not be, but it's a time when he shared a meal with his companions, his disciples. And we do so today. And you are all invited. No one's turned away. And may the blessings of God be with us. Let us pray. Loving, gracious, and holy God, as we gather around your table today, remind us of your stories. Remind us of Jesus' healings. Remind us of your presence with us. For you commanded light to shine out of darkness and the days are getting longer. You've given us your son, Jesus Christ, who sat at the table with us. And we have so many stories filled with those meal, meal times. And you have given us your spirit to stay with us. A spirit that takes these simple elements of bread and juice and lifts them to the sacred. So the table is set and we are surrounding it. We know you're with us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the story comes down to us generation after generation that on the night of his arrest, Jesus went to an upper room And he sat at table with his disciples as we are gathered around this table, your table. And then he takes bread. I have a small cracker we often use in the Celtic Evensong service we use today. And he takes it, and after he blesses it, he breaks it and says, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus takes the cup It says, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So I ask that you take the bread, the bread of life, and the cup of salvation. Eat and drink now, all of you. And so let us then have a blessing after our meal. We often have a blessing before, but this one comes afterward, a blessing that we know so well. A blessing in thanksgiving for what we've shared together. A blessing for what we might do beyond this table out in the world. So join me then. 
A Celtic Blessing from John Philip Newell. In body, mind, and spirit, may you be well this day. And may you be strong for the work of healing in the world. We come now to the message based on John in the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. It's the cleansing of the temple. I will note before we begin the message that every gospel seems to have this story in it, but John is the one that puts it early in the gospel. The synoptics put it later on in the last week of Jesus' life before the crucifixion, of course. But John here, puts it right after the wedding in Cana. We wonder why, scholars do, why he did that so early on, until we begin to understand that we know Jesus' ministry to be one that went from perhaps even as as short as nine months to three years. John is the one that has multiple years in the stories, maybe up to three years. And so to put it after the wedding in Cana, after the first miracle, is maybe not too strange. Jesus is telling us right away, John is, about Jesus, that Jesus is a prophet in a long line and tradition of the prophecies and reminding us that Jesus goes to the temple and he will not allow worship to be in any way desecrated as we find this story today. Last week we talked about what it might mean to be a disciple of Jesus. Today we talk about what it might mean to be the church of Jesus. So join me then after prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious and holy God, you come to us this day You come to us with stories. You come to us with your compassion and love. May we be open to your presence and open to the words you have for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As our text begins, Passover is near. The hearts and minds of all the pilgrims that have come to Jerusalem are now focused on the Exodus story. Not only the event of Exodus, but the deliverance that it brought. And so people gathered from across the world, the known world at the time, to crowd into that great city on the hill, to come to the temple, and to be part of 
a chaotic scene of Passover. Let me just describe a little bit more about what we're seeing in the story. First, the temple. The temple was built, as we know, you know, King Solomon's temple, David, the time of David the king, and how they placed the ark where God was. They now made it a house for God. But in 587 or so, the Babylonians took away a, a lot of the leaders of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. They were in exile for generations, and they finally came back to find a ruined temple. They tried to rebuild it, but it wasn't at all like the, its previous glory. Until 20 BC, when Herod the Great wanted to try to uh, appease the Jewish people, perhaps to remind them of his power, he decided he would rebuild the temple. And it took him years and years. At this point in our story, perhaps 27, 28 AD, when this story took place with Jesus cleansing the temple, the work had been about 46 or 47 or 48 years in the making to get that temple back to its earlier glory. But it would take decades beyond that until 64 AD when it was finally completed. All the work was completed. The beautiful marble walls with the gold and the jewels. The certain amazement that people had when they would see that temple when they saw it from a distance. It was a glorious building, it really was. Only six years later after it was finally completed would it be burned down, destroyed again by the Romans. So the temple is a big backdrop to this story. But also the money changers. A word about the money changers. We always hear about them and how Jesus turned the tables over because he was so upset with them. Well, it was a requirement that the money that they used as a temple tax could not have an image on them, a face. No graven image, it says in the Old Testament. And so people came from all over the world and they brought their own coins that had pictures of people, their leaders engraved on them, gods engraved on them. And they had to have them changed into shekels, to coins that if you rub them enough, nothing would come off of them. They would not lose their value or their weight. And they had no image on them. So they did the money changing. I'm sure the money changers thought they were doing a good deed, helping these pilgrims to come and show the, their devotion to Yahweh. So then we have the temple and the money changers and then the animals. It's estimated by some scholars and historians that there may have been up to 100,000 sheep in Jerusalem during the Passover, sheep to be slaughtered, along with cattle and birds. And they had to be unblemished. I mean, nothing, nothing could be wrong with the way they looked. And if you're traveling a distance to Jerusalem, and that journey would no doubt bring some blemishes onto the animal. And so they would have to buy a bird, a sheep, cattle, cow, depending on how much money they had. And they made money on that. Both the temple made money on all of these endeavors. Every year at Passover, people would do the same thing over and over again. It became a ritual. It became just what they did. And the more they did it, the more it seemed to be okay. I wonder how many times we think about what we do in the church. We do things over and over, year by year by year. And after a while, we get used to it. We have all these rituals. Wondering if some of these rituals are really based on our faith, based on who we need to be as people of God, or are they just simply tradition? What we've always done. I think in this time of COVID, we're reassessing who we are as church, as people who follow Jesus. We're reassessing what the church should be all about. 
And maybe this is our time to do so on a day when Jesus cleanses the temple. Maybe we have to imagine Jesus is cleansing the church. What if Jesus was to come into our church buildings today? What would he say that we needed to get rid of? What would he turn over? What would he be upset about? It's a time to get rid of some of the clutter, perhaps, as I mentioned earlier with the children. But what might it mean for us? Well, I think today is the day of the new deliverance. Oh, we know the old deliverance of Exodus, of coming out of bondage from Egypt to the Promised Land. That's what Passover is all about, how they were able to do that, how God protected them and saved them and got them through to the Promised Land. But what about today? What is our new deliverance today? Well, just a few quick thoughts. Maybe we look again at our buildings, our church buildings. As Jesus saw this grand temple before him, as he went into this temple, into the outer part of it called the, the place for the Gentiles, where the money changing was taking place, let us too look at our own buildings, knowing full well that they're so hard to keep up anymore. Most of our churches are old buildings. It's always trying to renovate them, maintain them enough that we might use them. But maybe today, this day of the new deliverance, we look at them again as tools for ministry, tools for mission. How might we retool them so that the world comes into our building and we go out into the world, share it with those in our neighborhood. Find new ways to do so. Use our buildings the best way we can. And so let's really look at the way we use our buildings. And also a new deliverance by looking at the way we do our rituals, our policies, our practices. See which ones we still need for our faith and which ones we can leave behind. I'm sure there's a long list of policies every church has, and for good reason. But do we need to do all of them in the same way? I'm really calling just simply to reassess what we do as church. What about our animals? Well, I hope that no one sacrifices animals anymore. But do we honor them? Do we treat them as part of God's creation? In our new deliverance, we look at animals differently. Do we eat them? Or do we simply want to value them? And we look at God's creation in a new way. I think a new deliverance is calling us for all of these ideas. Because I know this. We're not going to find salvation in a building. We're not going to find healing in white marble. We're not going to find our future in the gold and jewels of that temple. We're going to find our future in the reign of God. We're going to find our healing through Jesus. We're going to find our salvation through the one who offers us wholeness and integrity and peace, Jesus the Christ. All these ideas now are coming forth today because Jesus talked about the temple, but he talked about the temple as being his own body, not that building that they were all in awe of. The word in Greek is the same word for building and body. People were confused back then. We're confused today, but only after he died did the disciples look back and say, that's what he meant. Jesus meant his own body. And we were in his presence all those years, and we didn't know it on our legend journey. I hope you find the salvation, the salvation you need, you're, you're yearning for, you're looking for. The salvation which means, and that's the exact definition of the word salus in Greek, of wholeness and peace, shalom, integrity, I hope we find healing. I hope we find together a future. A future where Jesus is present with us. 
in his stories, in his wisdom, his teachings, his being. It's part of the journey to the cross. And so we continue that journey today, the day of the new deliverance. Now we come to the offering. And as we find ourselves in that story of Jesus cleansing the temple, we know that people went to the temple with their own offerings, offerings of doves or sheep or cows. Well, we don't do that anymore. Not sacrifice animals. But we do find a way that we might sacrifice somehow in our life so we might give to others. Sacrifice so we might be an offering to God. Sacrifice so that the world might find some healing. So I hope today we remember the ways we can do so. We can volunteer, we can give of our time, our expertise, but also our, of our money as well. And with great thanks do I offer my gratitude for your offering today in, in all those ways and the offerings of people that have sent checks into the church that we might continue our ministry and I'm going to place them in the offering plates to remind myself that other people are giving offerings every day. I hope you give to the church, not only this church, but maybe the church you belong to. Give to other ministries in our community, other programs that are helping people. The world needs great help today. I hope you're part of it. And so we give thanks for all the ways that we can give back to all the good things that God has given us. So with great thanks and blessings, we lift up our offerings today. Amen. Oh
Join me now as we gather in prayer, gathered not so much in person, but gathered in spirit. And we pray. Great and gracious God, in this Lenten season, we remember we went with Jesus to the top of the mountain and experienced the transfiguration. As with his disciples, we too want to stay there in glory, in the wonderful experience of being together, in seeing the transfiguration of Jesus where glory, your glory, shone bright around him. And now we notice that while we wanted to stay there then, we were called down the mountain. From that mountaintop experience, we experienced this season of Lent, and we're more mindful of the people around us, and we notice coming down from that mountain, there are people around us who are hungry and homeless and hopeless. And we pray, O oh God, that we might not only see them, but we might want to feed them and house them and even hold them. We would reach out when we cannot touch. We would offer food when we're nervous about the connection. We would offer a place for people to stay when we're not so sure it's safe. Help us, we pray, O oh God, to be your glad and grateful people in this holy season. May we experience some of that mountaintop glory, even as we experience some of the same hungers and loneliness that we think are a part only of the lives of others. Help us, we pray, to reach out, to figuratively touch each other, to keep each other in our prayers, and in our actions. Hear our prayers, O oh God, as we remember people on the prayer list of this congregation. Hear us as we pray for leadership in the life of this church, for Harry and others serving us on the pastoral staff, for others who serve us as administrators, as committee chairs and committee members, Hear our prayers, O oh God, as we pray for people whose names we know and whose lives we know, and as we pray for others whose names and lives are similar to us and similar to our needs. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray for our own needs. As we celebrate our mobility and health, we remember those for whom mobility and health are not happy memories. As we celebrate our living opportunities, we remember those for whom homelessness is such a reality. As we pray for others, so we pray for ourselves. We give you thanks, O oh God, for progress made for the vaccination against the pandemic for COVID-19. We are grateful for all who have their shots and for all who are scheduled and for all whose schedules are not yet known. We give you thanks, O oh God, with great hope for promise of returns to health. And we pray, O oh God, for people whose lives have been uh, permanently changed, for people who have experienced the loss of life in their loved ones for people whose grief continues even when hope seems to be more with us. We pray still, O oh God, that you might grant us opportunities to surrender what we might let go of and to build upon the changes that need to be made. 
Grant us, we pray, O oh God, to see your work in the midst of all that is happening around us. Fill us with increased trust in your love for us all. Hear our prayers, O oh God, as we give them words, even in our silence. Hear our prayers, O oh God, as you would speak to us. Hear us and speak to us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us as faithful disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now for our benediction, the closing words of a service, a blessing as we go out into the world. So let us go forth into the world in peace on this third Sunday of Lent. Cleanse of our sins and loving one another, and do not render evil for evil, but support the weak and strengthen the faint-hearted. And remember the story of Jesus cleansing the temple the day of the new deliverance from bondage to freedom, from Egypt to the promised land. May we remember the promises of God, of what it means to be in a promised land, to share who we are with others, to give some of our wealth to those in need, to help those who mourn and are fearful today. Oh, all of this is what we've been given as followers of Jesus Christ that we might share with the world the love and compassion and mercy of God. Do so this day as we continue our Lenten journey. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us, go with us, remain with us until we meet again.